come back for worship uh, tomorrow. Greg will be preaching. And then after service, they're right below us in Community Hall. We will have a BNG webinar. Uh, where Rob, Garrett, uh, myself, and Mark will do some discussing right after church, and there will be lunch. So make sure that you come back around for that. All right. Robert P. Jones holds a Ph.D. in religion from Emory University, an MDiv from Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary, a Bachelor of Science in Computing Science and Mathematics from Mississippi College. He was selected by Emory University's Graduate Division of Religion as Distinguished Alumnus of the Year in 2013 and as well at Mississippi College's Mathematics Department as Alumnus of the Year in 2016. He's the president and founder of Public Religion Research Institute. He is the author of New York Times bestseller, The Hidden Roots of White Supremacy and the Path to a Shared American Future, uh, White Too Long, The Legacy of White Supremacy in American Christianity, which won a 2021 American Book Award, and also the author of The End of White Christian American, which won a 2019 Grawmeyer Award in religion. He writes weekly newsletters for those dedicated to the work of truth-telling, repair, and healing from the legacy of white supremacy in American Christianity. Greg Garrett holds a PhD from Oklahoma State University. I'm not usually, I don't like many Oklahomans being from there, but you know, I love you, Greg. Uh, uh, MDiv from Episcopal Seminary and an MA and BA from University of Central Oklahoma. He is a professional writer who teaches creative writing, film, literature, and theology classes at Baylor University. He's the author of almost 30 books of fiction, nonfiction, memoir, translation, including the uh, critically acclaimed novel Freebird, Cycling, Shame, The Prodigal, and Bastille Day. One that you all are best known for, as we've read and done studies here at Wilshire, uh, is The Gospel According to James Baldwin. We're so grateful for both of you to be with us and to share in discussion today and tomorrow. Uh, how about we give a round of applause for these two wonderful presenters. Thank you so much. Uh, it's such a joy to be back at Wilshire and to welcome my friend Robert Jones. Um, these are better chairs than we had last time. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, what we're going to do today is we're going to talk a little bit about race, religion, and politics. And uh, our angle of vision for the day is we're going to try and do so by talking uh, about our most recent books, uh, which for Robbie is The Hidden Reefs of White Supremacy, for me is The Gospel According to James Baldwin. Uh, and then tomorrow we'll come back to this and probably dig deeper into racism in the church, uh, which is something that, that he and I are both uh, very interested in and, and committed to uh, combating. Um, and so what we're going to do today is just sort of have a conversation uh, for 30 or 40 minutes maybe, and then see if there are questions from the floor. Uh, so we would be happy to respond to questions, and as I said, we're delighted to be here. Robbie, thank you so much for coming to Dallas. Oh, yeah, well, thank you. Uh, I have been here before. So welcome to all of you who are here in the room today, and, and welcome to those of you who are joining us now or later. Uh, I hope that this will be uh, a useful and blessed time um, for you all, and, and thank you so much uh, for taking your time to sit down and wrestle with some of these hard questions. So, Robbie, I'm going to start off with this. Um, this most recent book, Hidden Roots of, of White Supremacy, um, does something different than a lot of the work that, that you and I read. Um, it doesn't just talk about how uh, enslaved people have been treated and why they've been treated such a way in America. You also thoughtfully link the history of European encounters with indigenous people. Um, and you come up with a, a historical and sort of theological framework for why it is that white people have felt like they could treat people who didn't look like them in such a way. 
So I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about why you wanted to write this book. What, what were the driving forces behind it for you? Well, thank you. Uh, Put those claims in conflict. And then, uh, in, in, um, 
what too long is really my Pennsylvania memoir I've ever written. I'm really trying to make sense of my own family's history, tracing it back to at least the 19th century in Georgia, um, right. where my ancestors on both sides are, uh, are from, and trying to and tell the truth about there. And you know, the, uh, thing, the, the title comes from Jane Paul. Yeah. Um, and then Ahmed uh, that he wrote um, after the assassination of Martin Luther King uh, Jr. Uh, and I'm going to bumble it a little bit. He basically says, um, the phrase about too long comes from this, he basically says, um, I have been impressed uh, for quite a long time that the great majority of the American, uh, of white Americans in the country are beyond any conceivable hope of moral rehabilitation. And then he kind of does this thing where he kind of has this long politics and stuff. Yeah. Uh, and he says, they have been white, if I may so put it, too long. They have been married to the line of white supremacy too long. Right? And it goes on, it's a beautiful you know, thing. Yeah. It's published in the New York Times uh, as an op-ed. But I think in that book, I was just trying to sit with that indictment and, and say, well, what is, how can I make sense of this? Um, as someone who grew up inside of a denomination, whose very purpose and being was being founded in 1845 to make enslaving others in the basis of the color of their skin compatible with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Like, that's the genesis story of the Southern Baptist Convention. Yeah. Right? Which, by the way, I mean, it's not surprising to you when you're in Texas, uh, uh, but by the way, right, it tells you something about American Christianity that that denomination, even after its decline, it has been declining by two years, remains the largest expression of Protestantism in the country, right, with that right, right? that explains a lot. So the, the new book, sorry, I'm going to get a long to answer your question. No, that's great. The new book, um, I tried to say, okay, well, that's my family story that I could trace into the early 1800s. I have a family Bible from 1815 that kind of anchors some of that story. Um, but how much further back does it go? What happens if we try to trace the thread even further back? And, like, where do we go with it? Like, how far does this this entanglement of white supremacy come from. And so in the new book, I, I trace it back, and I um, uh, trace it back at least uh, there and make the case that one place we can look is 1493, yeah. right? Not, to, not 1492, uh, the year that Columbus sailed the ocean blue, as we all kind of learned uh, in that little ditty in, uh, in elementary school. But the next year, and what happened there is that he went back, so Columbus goes back. He still doesn't know where he's been, by the way, but he does go back. Right? And, sa and says, um, I, I'm going to go back, and I need a bunch of stuff. I need more ships. I need more soldiers. I need more missionaries. I need more supplies. But the thing that I think has been mostly overlooked is that he says he needs something else, and that is that he needs a moral mandate for what he's about to do for the whole colonial project. Uh, and who does he look to? Uh, he looks to the European Christian church to get this moral mandate. So in the book, I trace it back to this series of uh, papal bulls and, uh, and uh, that were issued in the, across the latter half of the 15th century uh, and culminating in one in 1493 yeah. uh, that gives Columbus uh, exactly what he's asking for, the moral mandate blessed by the church. Uh, and it says, you know, and it basically what it does is it, it, it says, well, there's a moral question here. Uh, and, and we should remember that the, the quote unquote discovery, right, of peoples and lands that nobody knew existed set off a kind of, it did set off a moral crisis in the church. Like, what, what do we do? Like, and, and like, how do we map those people onto our moral and religious landscape? What obligations do we have uh, to right. those people? And they answered that question. It turns out the popes answered that question with a question of their own. And that question was, well, are they Christian? Yeah. Now, of course, they knew the answer, right, to that question. The answer was no. And if the question, if the answer was no, then a whole series of things fell out. They were to be considered, and this is like in the language of the documents, enemies of Christ. And as enemies of Christ, uh, it meant that they had no rights to the land, they had no rights to their own labor, uh, that, their, that their goods could be stolen, and it even spells it out in the documents. Uh, and again, this is from the hand of the Pope, who at the time was the head of the whole Western Christian Church. Right. Um, uh, it, it, it says, you know, you have the right to take all this stuff and to submit their persons to perpetual slavery. Right from the hand of, of the head of the Christian Church, uh, and 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 you know I know where many of us are mostly Protestant in this world. So unless you start feeling smug, this is before the Protestant Reformation. Right, there are no Protestants in the world. So yeah. all of uh, kind of Western Christianity is looking to the Pope uh, in in Rome uh, for this and this blessing 
gets the whole thing off the ground. So it's Christianity that gets the entire colonial project its moral mandate from the very beginning. And this kind of runs right through. So the version of Christianity that lands on these shores mm -hmm. that funds uh, genocide of Native Americans and indigenous people, that funds the entire kind of transatlantic slave trade, is this idea that these lands are a kind of promised land reserved for European Christians. Right? That's the idea behind all of this. And that whatever these other people are losing, we are giving them Christianity, and European civilization. And those two things outweigh anything else that they've lost. Like that's the moral logic. Yeah. yeah. And, and I mean, the title of your book, I mean, basically what you're telling us is, this is how far back we go to see the roots of the church in exploiting or marginalizing everybody who is, I mean, just to sort of put it in contemporary terms, not a straight white Christian male here in America. Uh, which is, uh, that's, I think, one of the great contributions of the book for me. Uh, because I mean, we've, we have friends, you know, who have done incredible work on uh, the history of the American church. But um, this was really the first time that I'd stopped to consider these things. It's, it's a great gift that that book gives us. Oh, well, thank you. Well, let me turn the tables to you. Like, um, you know, so you've written a lot of books. Like, why, why, why did you take, you know, why, why the book on James Baldwin? Like, what, yeah. what really pushed you to kind of uh, do that work? Yeah, this, uh, this is not the first book, um, and you know, now as I approach the end of my life, time grows short. Are you? I hope you're not. No, 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 I'm not like here to make an announcement today, like I've got, you know. Um, but it, it, I, I'm trying to be much more conscious about the things that I want to write about, and I mean, you always have to be, as you know, I mean, like you were talking about, I started this book some years before it finally came out. Um, and the roots of this book for me were sort of dual. Um, first, I've been teaching James Baldwin for a long time at Baylor University. And my students are transformed by him. They're, they're challenged by him, they're transformed by him. Uh, they're, they're encouraged to think about the world from the standpoint of a, a, like a particularly creative and artistic human being who can tell them about his life and allow them to understand the, the materials of that life. And they're also encountered with, uh, honestly, the only word is love, uh, because one of the operative words in James Baldwin's work is love. And uh, early on in uh, The Fire Next Time, which some of you may know, it's probably his best known uh, book uh, on the bestseller list for something like 41 weeks in 1963. Uh, very early in that book, the first, uh, in the trade paperback version of the book, it's uh, seven pages, the letter that he writes to his 14-year-old nephew, James. And he goes on to strike the entire litany of everything that has been done to him, to his father, to, uh, to his brother, to his nephew. Uh, and it's actually very similar to that, that long, long passage in a uh, letter from Birmingham jail where Martin Luther King is responding to uh, the, the white clergyman saying, wait. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just like this long sort of clause, you know, clause, 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 you know, like building the case, building the case. And you get to the end of that, and if you're a person who looks like us, you're like, oh my God, we are, we've been white too long, we're irredeemable. And then Baldwin says to his nephew, but I'm gonna tell you, you have to love them. You honestly have to love them because they are caught in their own history and we have to move forward together. And so, you know, we look at the 60s, there are all these flamethrowers and, and people rightfully filled with rage yeah. at the injustice. And although Baldwin formally left the church as a teenager, there is still this incredible Christian strain of forgiveness in him. So that's, that's a thing that I think my students respond to, as well as that, that whole thing of being seen, particularly if they're people of color. Um, and then the second thing is that Baldwin transforms me. Uh, I've been doing this work um, of racial reconciliation for some years now, and Baldwin is one of the people who inspired me to confront it in the church, in our schools, in our countries. Um, I carry a, at least one Baldwin book with me everywhere. I've got two of them on the dais today in case I need them. <laughs> you never know when you might need some James Baldwin. Um, and so I've, I've carried the fire next time, you know, all over the world. 
And short of the Holy Scriptures, there is nothing I come back to more often than James Baldwin. Um, and so I thought, if I'm going to spend some years writing this, and it turned out to be like five or six, mm. I, I want to continue this journey with this great artist, this great human being who, who teaches me how to do better and to be better. Um, and that, for me, was the inspiration. And you, know, you and I have talked about this. The, the goals that I had for the book, I wanted people who had never read James Baldwin to be fascinated by him and pick up a book. And then I wanted people like us uh, who loved James Baldwin to have a, a framework that might help them uh, appreciate him more or drive them back mm -hmm. to the books. So it's, um, it is hard to pick your favorite books because it's like picking your favorite children. And um, so I'm not going to say that this is my favorite book, but I am, I'm really proud of it. And it was an amazing journey for me. Uh, to be able to learn about him, to do the archival research, to read his letters, to hold his manuscripts, uh, and to actually discover some brand new works that I'd never read before, just because I had my little teaching, you know, group. And I thought, how is it possible I haven't read this? Um, so that's, that's been the thing. It was, it was a journey for me, but I wanted to take other people on a journey with Baldwin as well. Yeah. I, I want to, like, pause on something you said, and maybe we could talk about it a little bit. Like sure. Because that language you used about um, people being, white people being caught, right, stuck. Yeah. And it has a lot for Baldwin to do with history. Yes. And the history we tell ourselves, the history we have taught our children. So maybe you could say a little bit more about that, and I'll do that. Because that, that's yeah. been, like, really important for me with, with Baldwin as well. Yeah, yeah. Because, yeah. I mean, I'm guessing you're going to talk origin stories maybe a little bit. Yeah. Um, and this is a thing I talk about a lot. I've... Robbie and I have been doing a lot of media uh, lately, uh, which is good and bad. I mean, it's good because it's important uh, for people to understand that these are issues that we're supposed to grapple with, and, and also, just honestly, to let people know that there's more than one kind of Christian voice in the American narrative. Um, but I... Oh. <laughs> yeah. but, but for me, as, a, as an educator... Um, it, it feels like Baldwin is particularly necessary at this moment because we've got state legislatures, we've got political figures, we've got all these people, you know, I mean, all these attacks on libraries and librarians and diversity initiatives and universities. Uh, and, and all of these are about, we don't like our history, and maybe if we don't have to teach it, we don't have to reckon with it. You know, maybe if we can ignore it, maybe if we can tell a different origin story, mm -hmm. <laughs> then we can continue in our sort of fantastic notion that we are still the lords of the universe. And so what Baldwin teaches, I almost say preaches, because often that's what he's doing, is we are shaped by our history and we ignore it at our peril. And so if as white people we're not paying attention to our history of, of repression, our history of injustice, um, then there is no possible way to deal with that history and begin to change it. And so that for me is, is the big thing. Like I, I, I come back again and again to, to Baldwin's insistence. Uh, he says in one of the later books, you know, I was taught in my, in my early church days, know from whence you came. Yeah. Know from whence you came. And if you can't be honest about that, if you can't be honest about where you came from, and you know, some years ago I looked around and I said, I gotta be honest about where I came from. Um, and I don't like this history. Yeah. Well, I, I think that's very similar to mine. Yeah, that I think the thing that has spurred me along is, is realizing that I had been lied to. Like, that's the thing, right? Is that I've been lied to by my Sunday school teachers. I've been <laughs> lied to by my pastors. I've been lied to by my history teachers. Like, all the way up and down. I yeah. went to public school in Mississippi. Uh, I graduated, I was valedictorian, so I learned everything the, the state of Mississippi asked me to learn, right? Uh, and when I graduated as a senior, I had never heard the name Medgar Evers. Yeah. And Medgar Evers was gunned down in his driveway nine miles from my driveway growing up. Never yeah. heard his name. Like, I had heard Emmett Till, but didn't really know the story. Yes. 
And there were certainly no markers anywhere in the state at the time, like telling any of that story anywhere inside of Mississippi. Yeah. Right. And so just kind of realizing like the the lie, right? And, and that, that I've come to kind of think of in, in order for us to get to health, we got to realize like we are the survivors of an apartheid state. Like that's who we are. Yeah. Right. And we, and we have to kind of if we're really going to understand and get anywhere near health, we've got to really take that in. Right. Every, you know, Dallas is no different than in any other city we could be having this conversation in, you can still today look at the map and look at the racial composition of the city yeah. and see the crime scene. Mm -hmm. Like it's there, right? You can look at uh, street names, river names, and you can see the indigenous, the imprint of the crime scene against indigenous people, like still on our maps. Yeah. But it's like sort of we've, made, we've rendered all that invisible, right? Because what we needed was a history that tells a story of impossible innocence about ourselves, right? And I think if, if we, you know, white Christian people have been guilty of anything, it's been like this, like, one, uh, like a woman actually was doing an interview in Macon, Georgia, um, put it to me this way. She said, the biggest thing we had to get over is that the sense that we were good people who do good things. Like, that's how we think of ourselves in the church, right? Yeah. We're good people who do good things. It's a pillar of the community, salt of the earth, like those yeah. kinds of things, right? Uh, but the real history here is much more complicated uh, than that and, and much more difficult uh, than, than that, right? And, you know, I've said, like, if every church in the country, like, often people say, well, where do we start? And I know that Wilshire is a church that has started this conversation, is on the path, hence we're here, um, having a conversation about, you know, white supremacy in the church on a Saturday, beautiful Saturday afternoon. Yeah. Um, uh, so, you know, thank you uh, for that. Uh, but, you know, the sense, though, that if every church, every kind of predominantly white church in the country would simply be honest about why they own the property that they own and why the building is in this street and not the one across town, like, we would be, we would get a long way, right? Because that would give us, as Baldwin puts it, a useful history, yeah. right? That would, because we, we have this kind of, um, a history that's a lie, and you can't leverage it for anything, because it's just, you start to put your hands on it, and it just dissipates, right? Because it's yeah. based on a lie. What we need is a useful history that we can grab a crowbar and get some, like, leverage on, uh, right? And I think that's the thing that Baldwin kind of helps us come to terms with. If we want to know who we are, and we certainly can't go anywhere forward without knowing who we are. Um, we're going to have to kind of sit with some difficult truths, but that will give us some useful history that we can actually get some leverage yeah. uh, on the future with. And, and just to follow this up a tiny bit, because you were saying, you know, every, every aspect of your life you were lied to. I mean, one of the things that's going to be in my sermon tomorrow is I'm going to kind of reflect on the church of my youth. Uh, and you, um, I think, have read Andrew Whitehead's um, book on white mm -hmm. supremacy yeah. that came out last fall. And uh, one of the things that kind of jogged my memory, I try often to forget about my early years in the church, but um, he said, you know, I was in that church for 18 years. And in all that time, there was never a single sermon about race, about marginalized people. Yeah. And I was like, oh my God, that's my church. And you know, it's, it's a lie by omission, um, but you're not telling the truth. Yeah. And I'm, this is showing up in my sermon tomorrow also. Like, you guys don't have to come now. <laughs> these, are, these are all the good bits. But, you know, Robbie, you and we'll I have talked about this. We'll just go straight to this. the invitation. Yeah, straight right. to the invitation, right. just as I am. Um, my, my parents moved us from uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, uh, which was one of the battlegrounds for school desegregation, um, to what I've come to understand now was a white flight suburb of Oklahoma City. There was not a single brown person in that town. During my years of school, there was one Hispanic family, one black family. They were made to feel unwelcome and left. Um, and you see, you see so many of these, uh, these examples. I've also been reading for the new book about you know, these, these towns that are, are still relics of the don't let the, the sun go down mm -hmm. on you mm -hmm. in this town. Uh, and some of those still exist and still have signs. And uh, they're scattered all over the country. And so it, it comes back to you know, Baldwin's insistence on our, our telling the truth and, and recognizing our history and not avoiding it. 
And uh, that's, that's one of the things he does so brilliantly in his essays, but he also does it in his artistic work. Um, and I was thinking about, you know, why do we hold on to our false histories? Um, well, Baldwin says, the status quo is so hard to change because if you acknowledge it, you have to do something about it. And, and so for many of us who are white, uh, after uh, George Floyd was murdered, there was this moment of recognition where something could have happened. And uh, you talk to people, I talk to people, I was in a bunch of churches with, uh, with people who are like, we see this now. We should have seen it before, but we see it now. Um, but then in the last five years, six years, seven years, it feels like there's been a rollback um, in terms of what's possible. And now a recognition of the injustice and the attempt to tell the true history is derided as woke. Um, and it, it, it's just a sort of one word dismissal. Uh, instead of this, this call to tell the yeah. truth. So th thinking about your book, uh, I wonder, you know, because you sort of focus on three areas mm -hmm. of the United States, and you have said before it could be any number of them, just, that's what you were telling us just now. Um, could you talk with us a little bit about you know, one of those particular places, you know, whether Mississippi or Oklahoma, or, yeah. um, and, and, and talk about what you discovered um, as you worked on the book, and, and maybe hold off on solutions, because I do want to talk about where you found grace mm -hmm. and, and saw a movement forward, but you know, what, what did you learn, for example, by looking at Mississippi and recognizing, hey, there, there were not any monuments up to, to talk about Emmett Till? Yeah. Thank you. Um, so the, the subtitle of the book is And the Path to a Shared American Future, right? So the hidden roots of white supremacy and a path to a shared American future. And I, I wanted to make sure I put the book on the ground and look to see where are the people like, like this, like having these conversations, trying to put things on the ground, trying to make a difference in their local community, so not an abstract conversation. So I, I, um, I was looking for places that had, you know, some acknowledgement of past injustice, um, both in terms of indigenous people and uh, African American people. So basically that European uh, interaction um, with both indigenous people and African people uh, and again, I could have written, you know, 50 chapters, one for every state in the country. This is not a Southern thing at all, right? This is a kind of U.S. Uh, American, uh, America's thing, actually. It's not even a, a kind of North America yeah. uh, thing. It, it extends to the entire Americas. Um, so I, looked, I ended up looking at Mississippi and Oklahoma and Minnesota, uh, right? And, and each of these places have kind of a history that they're struggling with, a group of people that have decided to tackle it and with varying degrees of success, like really mm -hmm. trying to work on building a different future uh, for the next generation, kind of doing the hard, uh, hard work. So I'll just, you know, I mentioned Emmett Till. Um, so this is a name that like, you know, you can go almost anywhere in the world and educated people know that name, yeah. uh, right? Um, but in Mississippi, uh, as late as 2000, if you had driven through the Delta, um, where all that went down in Tallahatchie County, uh, Mississippi, there was not a single marker of any kind acknowledging it, not on the courthouse where the trial uh, took place and his killers were let go in 67 minutes of deliberation, uh, not uh, anywhere where uh, the, there's a site where he was tortured, the site where he was abducted, like it was just nothing uh, there. There was a memorial highway to the racist sheriff uh, that presided at the trial, right, and that kind of mishandled uh, the entire investigation. There was a, burn, a, a, a Clarence Strider uh, highway, uh, Memorial Highway there, uh, but nothing uh, to Emmett Till. And there was a group of, um, uh, of people, you know, just like this, um, who decided um, that they wanted to acknowledge this awful injustice that had happened in their community. Uh, now, this is Tallahatchie County. It's a very rural, very um, kind of poor county. The county seat is Sumner. It has 600 and some odd people uh, in, in, the, in the county seat town. Um, it's still, you know, it is plantation land, uh, uh, with um, kind of tenant farmers, like that's the kind of setup here. So not a lot of resources, and yet a group of people started meeting together and decided, like, what they first wanted to do is, like, we just want to apologize to the uh, descendants of the Till family for what happened in this place, right, for the injustice that happened in this place. Yeah. Um, and that's how it started, and over a year, they, met, they had to meet for years, like, literally meet for years to get to a place where a group of white and black people could come to an agreement about what to say. Uh, about about this, and to even battles over whether they could use the word apologize or not, 
mm -hmm. right? Uh, so those kinds of things um, were, and they hammered it out. Uh, and these were, you know, like descendants of enslaved people and descendants of enslavers, and they all knew their own family histories all the way back. So it's a very yeah. fraught, you know, environment, and yet they persisted and stayed with it. Um, uh, and I won't get too far down the road, but I mean, they, they, they did issue the apology and then kept going yeah. once they had done that. I mean, that was the kind of inspiring thing, and then kept going. Uh, there is now um, an Emmett Till Interpretive Center on the town square in Sumner. Uh, Mississippi has a summer program for kids all over the, the, um, the county. Um, there is uh, memorial markers that they put up. Now, some of them, you may have read stories, yeah. were shot up by the local fraternity uh, dudes at Ole Miss um, uh, when they were put up. But they kept putting the signs back up, uh, yeah. right, uh, kind of memorialized. So there's now a story being told there that it was not being told um, all the way up. And some similar stories in both Oklahoma um, around the Tulsa uh, race massacre and in Minnesota um, around a lynching that occurred on the town square. I won't give too many details, but in 1920, there was a lynching in, uh, in Duluth, uh, Minnesota, uh, of three African American men who were falsely accused um, of sexually assaulting a white woman um, uh, there. And 10,000 people uh, in good Midwestern Yankee uh, Minnesota turned out for the lynching, which was a tenth of the population of the town um, at, at the time. And so there's people uh, kind of wrestling with that history in the far, far north, right? It's right next yeah. to Canada um, up there, not, not, a, not far uh, there. So try to tell those stories because I, I think it's in places like this and local communities of people who are willing to do the long, hard work of really reckoning with what happened in this place and what are we going to do about what happened in this place so that we can move forward together that I think really makes a difference. Yeah, and I hope we'll talk more about this tomorrow. Um, one of my great heroes is a woman named Dr. Catherine Meeks. And uh, she's a scholar from Atlanta, and she's one of the leading lights in racial repair work in the Episcopal Church. Um, she is also one of the only uh, black people I know who can walk into a room full of white people who don't want to listen to her. And before she leaves, they are all in love with her and, and believe her. And one of the things that she taught me early on, which I think is really important, because you talked about it, this was a process that took years. Yeah. You know, because what I, I think what a lot of white people wanted to do after George Floyd was say, okay, I get it, and stop. <laughs> but, but what Dr. Meeks always teaches is that this work of racial repair, any of these like intersectional repairs, um, is going to take a long time because there is this long history and systemic history of oppression of, of, of people who don't look like us. And... One of the things I always remember, she says, this is not a sprint. Every white person wants this to be a sprint. It's a marathon. And, I mean, you've got to get up and armor yourself in the whole armor of God and, you know, eat your Wheaties <laughs> and go out there and try and do some justice. Um, but that, that, that was one of the things that I loved is that, you know, in each of those sections of the book, you were able to talk about this is a process and it's going somewhere, it's not done, you know, not right. by any means, but it's, it's, it's going somewhere. Yeah, and some unexpected directions, too, that they wouldn't have anticipated when they started on the path, right? But it was getting on the path that mattered, right, that took them to the place they, you know, needed to go. Yeah. yeah. So I've got a thing I wanted to ask about. Um, I wrote it down. One of the things that I have loved about your work, especially the last two books, and, and I think you know, the end of white Christian America is so important, I mean, and that data is, is vital for people because stats, stats help people understand things. Uh, but you know, I'm a story person. And you tell stories uh, in the new book about these, these people that you encountered. You tell stories about uh, the, the lynching in Minnesota and you know, the clergy person standing up trying to stop it. I mean, like those, those things are indelible memories. But as I have told you, one of the things that makes these last two books so powerful and profound for me is that you've interwoven your own story with this. And I think that's one of the things that Baldwin does is he weaves his own story in with it. Um, but could you talk just a little bit, I mean, you know, maybe writer to writer, uh, what has it been like, you know, as a person who was good at the maths and is a stat person, because you're still dropping stats like nobody's business, but to, to tell stories in a skillful way and to, 
you know, have people respond to them? Yeah, it's, it's been hard. I mean, so I was also trained as an academic, right? And, and for those of you who've been in that world, you know, the last thing you're supposed to use is a first person pronoun, right? Uh, when, you're, when you're writing, um, no eyes, no wheeze. Um, you stay away from that stuff, right? It's, you know, even one wonders, you know, those kinds of things. One gonna, indeed wonders. Right, if you're gonna try to go there, but. Um, Whether and if. I think it's, it's been, um, I just realized it was necessary, right? If I was gonna be honest about what I was up to. Yeah. I just, so it, it, it came from that place and realizing, okay, I'm, it is indeed what's motivating me. I need to put it on, I need to put what's motivating me on the page. Uh, and then realizing I need to tell like some of my family stories, I mentioned this family Bible. From 1815, I also have an estate settlement from that same family, yeah. um, showing right that among their earthly possessions were four human beings, right by name, by 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 a name and amount in this estate settlement, and the same owners of that Bible that and this Bible is like the most cherished possession on my mother's side of the family. Yeah. It's been passed down from generations since 1815, right, and yet those folks show no contradiction between this Bible that they so loved and the people that they enslaved, right? Just saw, and were part of the, the domination getting off the ground in Georgia, uh, right? That, that made that officially compatible, right? Uh, in, the, in the founding of the Southern Baptist uh, Convention. So I, I think it's, it's just been trying to get, and again, because I think the journey was, what happens if I don't flinch? Mm. Like what happens if I hold the gaze? What happens if I just sit here in this uncomfortable, place yeah and I think that's what I've been trying and, and, and like you know there's been several times where I've had to kind of push away from the desk and just think like, I'm done for the day but I know I got to come back here tomorrow mm -hmm. all right because it was just too much for me to take in at, at one time so I've had some of those experiences too but I think it's been so important again because like I don't want a faith that's wrapped up in white supremacy right you know like I and I, I think none of us really do, but I, I, it's, I don't think we realize, and I certainly didn't realize, how difficult it is to find that space when we've had centuries of willful entanglement of those things. We've invited white supremacy into these pews, right, for generations. And so, yeah, it's going to be more than a sprint to kind of sort, you know, all of this out. Um, the, um, I guess one thing I'll, I think I'm saying here at the end that I... And when it gets to things like, you know, solutions and what do we do, and I think one of the, the challenge, there's a challenge, two challenges I want to just highlight here that I think we've got to, again, just kind of sit with. One is, I tried to acknowledge it in the last book, The Truth, that um, the crime is so big, we can't really make it right. Yeah. And, like, that's a really hard thing to sit with. Like, if you think of yourself as a justice-oriented person, wanting to be a justice-oriented person. And I think the temptation then, is if you, could, if you admit that, the temptation is, well, okay, well, I just throw up my hands, right? And, and because there's no way to make it right, right? Yeah, and so that's an excuse to do nothing. It is, right? But, but I think the other thing that's related to this is I, I realized that in studying on all the ways, um, and again, like, uh, I'll say one more thing real quick. It's like so clear to me that if at any moment in our nation's history, people in churches like this had stood up together, predominantly you know, white churches, white Christian people had stood up and said a collective no. Yeah. We could have ended slavery, we could have ended segregation, we could have ended Jim Crow, over, literally overnight. And we just didn't do it. We just wouldn't do it. And I think kind of hanging on to that, right, and then thinking, okay, and, and so we have been the beneficiaries. What do we do now? And then I think, again, oh, it's just so complicated that people want to kind of give up and not think about it. Um, but the, the thing that's kind of holding on to me, and I'll stop with this, is um, it was so clear to me in all the historical research I did how infinitely creative we were when it came to defrauding people. Yeah. You know, how, what, what ends we would go to, legal loopholes, structuring laws that sort of seem to say one thing and really said another, um, looking the other way, like all these kind of schemes and gambits uh, and, you know, mechanisms to sort of like enslave, defraud, kill, like 
we have been so creative, right, when it comes to all that. I have a line in the book where it said, you know, um, greed spawns a million schemes while repentance throws up its hands. And we've got to, like, get in a better place where we're like, okay, we can make it righter, um, right? Um, we can certainly do that. And we've got to, like, let a thousand things bloom, I think, and harness the creativity that we use to kind of, for our benefit, right, to kind of right the scales um, as, much as, we, as much as we can. Good. So I'm going to offer a quick follow-up to that, yeah. and we're going to turn to you. We, should, we went a little yeah. bit over what I had planned to do, but as you've noticed, we kind of like to talk. <laughs> um, so if, if a couple of you could have questions prepared and then be ready to sort of use your good outdoor church voice, um, that would be great. Um, I, I don't know if you saw, I did an interview with our friend Jamar Tisby a couple of weeks ago mm -hmm. for... Yeah for my series for Baptist News Global, uh, check it out. Um, and Jamar Tisby, for those of you that, that don't know, is a, a groundbreaking uh, black theologian who looks at the racist history of the American church. And uh, sort of to go along with what Robbie was saying, Jamar told me, what people need to understand is our history did not have to be this way. There were places where people could have done something different. And, and what inspires me about that is that why couldn't this be a time when we do something different? Um, so that's kind of what I'm sitting with yeah. of late. I mean, why not? Why not now? Why not now? So let me let me turn to the audience and see if any of you have questions. And yes, right here. Okay, so for those of you watching at home, uh, the question is, how, how can we start these conversations, uh, particularly with people who aren't aware of the history or maybe don't want to have them? Um, and that's, I mean, that's a central part of the work that I'm doing uh, in these conferences we've done at Baylor on racism in the church. And it's something that I'm asking everybody for this interview series. Um, you know, how, how do we have these conversations? Are, are there some people who are so far gone that we can't, we can't speak to them. And you know, one of the huge problems we face in this era is that we're not all living with a shared reality um, because there are people who get their media, uh, their news, news uh, from a very different uh, perspective. And it is a, a white supremacist perspective and it, it tends to reinforce, I'm sure we'll talk more tomorrow about white Christian nationalism, which is something that Robbie is apparently the godfather of studying uh, in, a, in a very complimentary article written earlier this week. He's being sarcastic. Yes, I am. Yeah. Um, so I would say first, uh, I, I reflect on Baldwin and the way that he approaches having this conversation with his readers or with people who heard his oratory he did not shy away from telling the truth and trying to let them know the history. Um, but he didn't do it in, how can I put it, in a hateful fashion. It wasn't, I'm right and you're wrong, although he was right. Um, I think one of the things, and one of the reasons the church has to be an agent, if not the agent for this work, is because, you know, as Howard Thurman says, it's, it's in the work that we do in worship that, that Christian love and compassion can reshape people. And that is, by the way, one of the things, you know, uh, Malcolm X, Dr. King, and Howard Thurman said, you know, it is the great tragedy of America that 11 o'clock on Sunday morning is still the most divided time of the week. Because what Howard Thurman was saying, and I believe it intensely, I think Baldwin and King did as well, is that Christian love is still something that can mediate these conversations. Um, now, some of you know I had an experience on social media last week with people who did not want to, to have a conversation in Christian love. And I think that that's, that's important for us to recognize, um, that there are some people who, for whatever reason, are, are, are not in a space where they can listen to us. Um, but I will tell you, one thing that encouraged me I don't know if I told you this. Like, I did a little bit of engagement before the vast Twitter flood overwhelmed me last week. 
But there was one guy that I reached out to and like we talked a couple of times, talked in you know, 200 characters, and he was like, okay, I kind of see what you're saying. I don't know that I agree with you, but I kind of see what you're saying. And I won't call for your resignation from Baylor University, uh, which made him one of the outliers in that conversation. So here, here is the thing. It is a hard conversation to have. It's always going to be a hard conversation to have. Um, but I think it can, to the degree that it's possible, and Robbie can speak about this some more as well, um, some of the people that I've been talking to in the interview series say, you know, facts may still matter to some people. You can present them with actual facts. Um, but I think the biggest thing is the, the way in which we approach the conversation. Um, and, and it is so easy, uh, you know, I was talking with uh, Jillian, George Mason's daughter in my, my column last week, my interview last week, and she said, I found that I was so sure that I was right that I was getting so angry. And so I think, you know, one of the things that has to happen from people of faith is that we have got to be responsible for taking down the heat. So like towards the end of the Twitter war, like the last thing that I posted on that subject before I went and away for several days was, I'm a teacher at a great Christian university. I'm accustomed to disagreement. So, I mean, disagree if you feel you have to. You know, and I didn't post this here because that would have generated even more hits, but it was like, and I will disagree with you lovingly. Because I don't, you know, my self-worth does not depend on your being wrong. I know where Jesus is on this. So. You want to get another question? Yep. I yeah, yeah. That was great. All right, we're doing the Oprah thing. <laughs> One of the things that's interesting to me as I try to have these conversations with my elders, many of whom have passed on already, and I grew up in the South, primarily in Middle Tennessee, is, well, we've all struggled. That was then. This is now. Yeah. And I try so hard to say, well, you know, if you can imagine aliens coming and imprisoning and enslaving and treating all of us like objects, do you think that would go away? Yeah, and, and if you said, well, the aliens were having a hard time as well. Um, Robbie, you wanna start that off? And then I, I've got a story to go with that though. Yeah, well, I mean, one thing I'm, I'm thinking about too, just in terms of talking to people, um, I'll give one little anecdote from my own family. Um, uh, so, the, the deal I made with my, because it's a lot of memoirs, some family stories in there, and, and basically, uh, you know, I was trying to be respectful f to tell stories that I thought were my own and not tell stories that were not my own to tell, yeah. uh, but at the same time wanted to be as honest as I could. Um, and so I had some, you know, stories about our own family uh, there, but, and, and I, I talked with my parents, not during the um, writing of the manuscript, but I sent it to them when it was done, right? So I didn't want to kind of do it during it, send it when it was done. Uh, and we ended up having some really interesting conversations because we, I didn't talk to them during it. I mean, I just used the family lore that I knew. Uh, but one of the things that's not in the book, uh, for example, uh, because it only came out after we had this conversation, after the manuscript was wrapped, is um, uh, my, my mother told me that the, the year 1963 has already come up, uh, right? Um, uh, but that in that year, um, there was a, a widespread effort uh, to integrate white churches. Uh, right, it happened in Jackson, happened in Atlanta, and Macon, other places, probably here too. I'm not sure of the history here, but that was in the early 62, 63, 64, there were these um, uh, integration campaigns. Uh, and uh, I found out that in East Macon Baptist Church, uh, where my grandfather uh, was a deacon, that one of his jobs on Sunday morning during yeah. 1963 was to stand on the front steps of the church and make sure no integrated group of people and no black people made it into the side, into the sanctuary. Yeah. And this was not like a wink, wink, nod, nod kind of secret agreement. This was an official assignment from the board of deacons. Like they rotated people out, uh, but like he was in the regular rotation of people who that was his job, right? And saw that very consistently with his role as a deacon, right? And in, in the church. And so like, 
this opened up a whole other set of conversations, right? Even in my own family that yeah. we hadn't had before. So I think by telling the stories that we know, it opens up other space. And that's not an argument, right? It's, it's, a, it's a story, right? It's a narrative and it's kind of like under, trying to understand, but I think it does open up other space for, and, and probably had, had I not started the conversation, I probably would have never heard that story. Yeah. Right. My, my mom would have gone to the grave with that story. I would not have known that about uh, about my family. But I think kind of take. So I think that's really important and kind of um, kind of moving us along and, and is opening up with these narratives. Yeah. yeah. And, and then I think what I'd like to say about your person who sort of essentially is saying, well, we know better now. Can't we just, you know, you know, move past this? Uh, and, and the way I often hear this expressed uh, from white people is color blindness. I don't see color, they say. And then as pastorally as I can, I try and say, you don't have to. You know, I'm a big, white, straight Christian male. And I walk around being a big, white Christian male all day long. And I don't have anybody treat me differently because of any of my identities. But, but here's a story, and Jeannie is going to make sure that I don't tell this badly because, yeah, she, she always wants me to make sure that I... I don't make myself look worse than I actually am. Um, a, a few years ago at Washington National Cathedral, uh, we were doing a program uh, sponsored by Baylor uh, where we were doing a weekend of uh, films about race. And uh, so we had showed uh, Spike Lee's Do the Right Thing in the nave of the cathedral. And just a little sidebar, I don't know if I've told you the story. Uh, Baylor's president, Linda Livingston, came to Washington, D.C. to give the official welcome from Baylor uh, at the National Cathedral, and she was late. And there are two things in the world that I cannot forgive. There is much that I can. I cannot forgive you not watching the whole movie <laughs> or talking to me during the movie. And so Linda Livingston, the president of Baylor University, my boss, comes down the aisle to the very front of the church and she leans over and she's like, what did I miss? <laughs> and uh, so I said to her, Just, it'll, it'll come to you. So, so after the movie was over, uh, I was part of a panel uh, on stage. So uh, Van Newkirk from the Atlantic Monthly, uh, Kelly Brown Douglas, the great black liberation theologian, uh, our friend Corva Coleman uh, from NPR News. And Corva was our moderator. And uh, I don't want to spoil the movie for you if you haven't seen it, but I can tell you, and you will not be surprised to know that it's about uh, systemic injustice and violence directed against black bodies. And uh, so Corva started with me as the lone white face on the, on the dais. And she said, Greg, would you tell us about your experiences with law enforcement? And I didn't see the thrust of her question initially. <laughs> and so I was like, well, I've, I've had a few. <laughs> I had an adventurous uh, teenage you know, set of years in Oklahoma, and I can tell you that I knew each of the three police officers in our town by name. Um, and so like, you know, everybody's chuckling, this is cute and quaint and funny. Um, and then she turns to Van Newkirk, uh, senior editor of the Atlantic Monthly, for my money, our era's James Baldwin, uh, the greatest writer that I know on uh, the myriad of things that Baldwin wrote about. And he is not a big guy. Uh, he looks very non-threatening, except for one thing. And that's the color of his skin. And so Corva turned to him and she said, Van, would you tell us about your experiences with law enforcement? And he put his hands out in front of him, like this. And Corva said, Van, can you explain to our audience, particularly the white members of our audience, what you are doing? And he said, I am putting my hands in plain view on the steering wheel so that I don't get killed. And so for everybody who says, we are past this, we can be colorblind, you can't be colorblind if what it, if the only thing that it comes from is your ability to walk around unimpeded during the day. There are still so many problems, individual, systemic, and we have to recognize this. And, and part of it is listening to these stories. You know, because when Van like did that, I was like, oh. and like light bulbs went off over Whitehead's all through the nave of Washington National Cathedral, because at least for a moment they understood. 
Good. Can we take like maybe two more? I can stay a little longer. We're <laughs> doing this. Um, Is that better? Um, I'm, I'm aware that the, the velocity of the civil rights movement really escalated after World War II, and a lot of the Emmett Till and um, Brown versus Board, you know, around 19, early 50s. I was curious if you are aware, if you could both comment on any academic work that's been done to reflect about how the Christian church in Germany worked itself through Nazism post-World War II, and is there anything instructive that we could take through that? And do we have scholars in America that have been writing about that that we could um, kind of take a look at um, as a model or framework? Well, let me, let me jump in because I don't, I don't have much. <laughs> um, but I mean, it, it, it does strike me that's a really useful framework for us to look at. I mean, the other thing I was thinking about earlier while Robbie was talking about this was looking at the end of apartheid in South Africa and, you know, the reconciliation committee uh, chaired by Desmond Tutu. Uh, we could really use a reconciliation committee chaired by Desmond Tutu. Um, so I'm not familiar with any scholarly stuff, but I'm, I'm sure if, I'm sure there is and it would be findable by somebody who has done that work. Yeah, I don't know of anything that's specific. I mean, the, the books I've read recently um, are Hitler's Willing Executioners, uh, uh, and the, the other one that's about, um, I'm blanking on the name of it now, that, that's about the way the Nazi movement actually borrowed from the Jim Crow South, right? I don't oh, know, right, right, right. Was right. It? Kast? Kast. Yeah. No, not Kast. Um, but that's in there as yeah, well. Yeah, but this is in Kast as yeah, well. Yeah, so Isabel Wilkerson, right, her latest right. book. So I haven't read anything about like the, the sort of churches trying to put it back together. It's very clear the churches were deeply complicit, right? It's Bonhoeffer's uh, entire story is how complicit the churches were, um, yeah. and he died, right, uh, for his unwillingness to go along um, uh, uh, from that. Uh, but here's the thing I think that's relevant for us is um, I mentioned earlier that we're the, like, we're the survivors of an apartheid state. But one of the, re one of the things that, like, uh, lends itself to reform, repentance, repair, all those kinds mm -hmm. of things is confession. Yeah. Right, we have a kind of Christian, you know, set of the theological tropes for this. Like, how do we understand all this? And like, we're still getting to the confession part, right? right. I think that's part of our problem. Like, we keep, we're, why are we having so much trouble with reparations? Why are we having so much trouble with the repairs? Probably because we're still having trouble with the confession. Uh, uh, part of it, uh, right? And we're still trying to get that part right because one of the things, I mean, I am struck, I was just in Berlin last uh, last spring and, you know, I was struck by, it's it's everywhere. I mean, there are the little stumble stones and the kind of bronze markers on the cobblestones saying, this is a Jewish family, here are their names, this is the day they were abducted, this is what happened to them. They're just on the sidewalk, right? Wow. There's plaques on the walls of, of um, form, houses of Jewish families that were abducted. Uh, there's a big, you know, Holocaust memorial in the middle of the city. Um, but here, like, we don't like to confess, right, that we ran an apartheid state in the, for most of our history. Like, that's not the story we want to tell um, about who we are and how we got to this place. Yeah. Um, and so I think that's actually, you know, and so one way Germany could do that is because they did actually, like, okay, own, yeah, we let the Nazis take over our country, right? Uh, and that party and its kind of really evil ideology and racist ideology take over our country. We still haven't fully, like, and in South Africa, same thing, like, yeah. it owned, right, the word apartheid. Um, and so whether it's apartheid or whether it's white supremacy or whatever, like, I, I think the problem is we're still trying to sort ourselves out and what we're willing to own as to how we got here. And that's why, by the way, um, our biggest fault lines are less going to be less about policy uh, and more and more about history. Like, that's why history, mm. right, is the battleground uh, yeah. right now. Whether it's branding books, uh, so-called critical race theory, like all, you know, all these things, tax on libraries, librarians, school boards, curriculum. Like, it's all about the, the genesis story that we're telling yeah. about how we got to this place, right? And th the stakes are really high. It's no wonder we're, because if we get that story right, we're going to get the repair part right. 
we get that story wrong, we're never going to get the repair part right. Yeah. So. Good. Yeah. Let's, let's take a couple more. Um, Timothy, you're... Read your oh, this is <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. When I read your book, um, my re I know Mississippi and Oklahoma, Minnesota was a bit of a surprise, mm -hmm. but I thought you need to write a handbook so other people will have a roadmap mm -hmm. for reconciliation. Um, and I know that's not the kind of writing either of you do, but that's sort of the kind of conversations you're having for sure, Greg. And I saw where David French has joined with a couple of people, the columnists for the New York Times, yeah. to write a curriculum for church small groups discussing the MAGA thing in a way that is civil conversation and asking the hard questions. Uh, have you thought about providing some more concrete guidelines for those of us who are too dumb to figure out how to do it on our own? Yeah. Well, I have a couple thoughts about that. Um, I got pushed hard by my editor to end the book with something like that. And I really did resist it. Um, and, and I think the one reason why I resisted it is because the thing that became clear to me is that there's a kind of organic shape that's rooted in the particulars of the community. Yeah. All right, that has to kind of be honored. And I worry that like, you know, here's your, I know you're not saying this, but you know, if I came up with like, and here's the 10 step program, right? For you and your community, you know, yeah. to, like, uh, that, that it just would uh, ring hollow. Um, I do, there is though, uh, you could talk about the Episcopal church, mm -hmm. uh, but I'm, I'm speaking in May, um, uh, I, we're finalizing it, but I think I'm speaking in May, um, at, at the, the United Church of Christ uh, has been putting together um, some curriculum, uh, right? For their churches uh, to, so it's happening, I think at the denominational level. And like one of the things they have is a, white supremacy church audit hmm. and it's like a checklist of like yeah. let's go through the curriculum what hymns do we sing what what's been preached on what has not been preached on right um what are the in here like really particular what does the children's literature look like yeah like who's represented who's not represented in the children's literature and like one of the worst offenders are those children's bibles with the pictures oh, yeah. in them they're like all white people like in all those children's bibles right so like what do we do about that? So there is some, some of that work, I think, happening. Um, it's sort of less, I think, my thing. Um, you know, but, and, and, I, and I also think that even that, though, is going to have to be like, really taken as a very loose framework. Because I think the most powerful things are, what happened like here? Like, why are we here? How did we get here? Um, that really does go all the way back, right? So which indigenous land is, is this, you know, church this building we're in sitting on um yeah. why are we in this part of dallas not another part of dallas right um what decisions went into that making was this place ever and I, i'm not like in training diet wilshire here this is true of everywhere i go was this place ever part of the restricted uh covenant uh for a neighborhood right that didn't allow any uh, non-white people to live in it uh, or or were, did it host meetings about that right here to yeah. kind of serve as an anchor point like all those kinds of things i think are really important but i'm in i'm uh enlivened because i know that's happening and it's also hap the episcopal church is also putting together yeah the episcopal um, church is doing some of that work um one thing that i do want to mention uh i am very drawn to the work of jamar tisby who i mentioned earlier as a historian uh but as an activist i mean he is at the heart and soul of, of uh, the work that's going on in repairing racism in american christianity and uh, i agree with robbie that every setting is gonna have a different um, approach to this, and it's gonna have to be based on conversation. Uh, one of the things that I think is really interesting, uh, in seminary and before seminary, I did uh, some work in uh, civic organizing. And uh, one of the things that we were taught from the very beginning is you can't go in with your preconceived set of notions about what's gonna happen. You've gotta to talk to the people, and they have gotta drive the truck. You know, they've. Their, their particular concerns and fears and, and whatever. Because uh, one of the things that I think white people have to be aware of is we have a tendency uh, to come in and think, you know, if we make this change, that's a good change. You know, there's a, there's a trope in Hollywood cinema called the white savior. We don't want to be white saviors. Um, we want to be, we want to work alongside 
the people of every community and to bring that community forward. But what I love about Jamar's work is that, that there is a rhythm to it, even though the individual like, circumstances might differ. And so, you know, like one of the things we talked about was recognition. You know, people have to recognize that there's a problem, have an awareness of it. Um, there have to be relationships. And this is what I was talking about with like community organizing. Um, so like Robbie and I share uh, the, the great uh, Kelly Brown Douglas as, as one of our, our friends. And I remember a conversation she and I had early in our friendship. Like there were things that I knew intellectually about how her life and the life of her family were different from mine. But then she talked about, you know, the first time she had to have the talk with her son. And in the circles that I grew up with, if you had a talk with your child, it was about the birds and the bees. <laughs> and it probably wasn't the least bit helpful. <laughs> uh, John Mulaney, the great comic, uh, talks about how he says, I, my dad talked to me about sex once, I think. <laughs> but when Kelly said I had to have the talk with him, what she was talking about was the thing we were talking about with Van Newkirk. I, I had to talk to my son Desmond about how when he walks out of the house, he has the best possible chance of coming home alive. And I'm not going to say the words that I said to her because we're in church. Um, but relationship shifts things. And uh, relationship also commits you. You know, you can have a factual knowledge of things. Like, I know factually. We live in a racist society. But when you love people who are directly affected by that day in and day out, then your heart is attached to that and not just mm. your head. And, and so Jamar Tisby's work, I think, is, is something that I would commend. I don't know if I'm going to write about this. I might. Like, I'm still learning. Like, I don't want to pretend that I have answers yet. I've seen some things work in some places. Um, but process, you know, like, like Dr. Meeks said, uh, like that continuing reconciliation comes from recognition and repentance and, and some kind of holy action. All right, John, you've had your hand up for a long time. We'll close with you if that's okay. <laughs> just want to make an announcement as we before we go to Don that if you would like to purchase any of their books you can go right here into the James Gallery after this time together and I believe y'all are signing copies and yeah, we'd be happy to. Uh, yeah. and so we'll have books for sale today and tomorrow um, it's been said several times today you are both men of privilege you are both men who speak truth to power. Do you have concerns about your safety, the safety of your family? Because as the poet says, America is a gun. Yes. Um, I mean, and Robbie has the stats. You know, it's, it's white American evangelicals who are most likely to believe that violence may be necessary to preserve the America that they want to see. Um, so yes, I do think about it. Um, I will tell you also, I, I thought a lot about um, Martin Luther King this past week. Uh, some of you know that early on um, during the, the bus boycott, uh, he, you know, he was getting like 70 death threats a day. Uh, a week after the story, I'm going to tell you his house was bombed. Um, and Martin Luther King was rational. You know, he was, he was intellectual. He was one of America's greatest preachers before he became Martin Luther King. And um, one night early in the bus boycott, and probably I'm sure you know this story, but um, he sat down at the kitchen table with a cup of coffee and he just, he was done. You know, his, his family was in danger. The, the threat level was so high against him. And he said, you know, he was just drained and depleted. And he said, I don't, I don't know what to do, God. I don't know what to do. You know, I, I want to do the right thing. I want to, I want to be this voice. And I, I don't know how. I don't know how to have the, the strength and the courage to do it. And uh, King told this story often. And as far as I know, this is the only mystic vision he ever experienced in his lifetime. But he said a voice tangibly came to him and said, Martin Luther, 
Stand up for truth. Stand up for justice. And I will be with you until the end of the world. Um, and you'll also hear my sermon tomorrow, I hope, where I talk about how important it is not to live in fear because when you live in fear, you can't do the things you're called to do. Um, so it, it does cross my mind, and, and Robbie can, can speak to that as well. Uh, and, and Robbie has a higher profile than I do. <laughs> um, and he's also better looking. So <laughs> he's a more immediate threat. In fact, I should just sort of walk next to you a lot. <laughs> It's, you might, honestly, my, my response to that is that um, I'm struck by how much looking the way I look still protects me. Yeah, um, that's and, true. And compared to uh, my friends of color who are doing the same work, right? I mean, the threats they get are double, triple, anything that comes my way, both online yeah. and, you know, in person. Um, security worries much higher. Yeah, and, and same for women. Yeah, that's right. You know, right. So yeah, some gender, of you know, you know my friend yeah. Beth Barr from right. Baylor, uh, our friend Kristen DeMay. Uh, they deal with abuse that, you know, that makes anything that we get look trivial. Yeah. So, you know, yeah, prudence, yes. Um, but, yeah, I, I, I think that's my struck, though, by, yeah, it's still, you know, it, it's still good to be a white guy uh, when it comes to this uh, sort of thing. And, I, and that privilege comes along uh, for the ride, um, and it's still a testimony to the very things that we're talking about. Um, the still, and you know, and I think the other thing is, it's still really important for people who look like us to be saying this, and not leaving it up to the people who don't look like us to say this. Because frankly, as I began, let me make a good place to end. Yeah. I began with Frederick Douglass, 1845. He's saying, between, you know, the. <laughs> religion of Christ and the Christianity of this land, I see the widest possible difference. By the way, the same year that the Southern Baptist Convention is formed, he, has, he says that, he writes that. Yeah. Right? Um, and that's, I think we're, we're still like very much living in that, yeah, that reality. So. Yeah. Well, thank you all so much for coming today. Uh, we're so grateful for you and hope that you've heard something that you oh. would, would want to hear. Oh, okay. oh please. Oh, we got one more. Yeah. Oh, wow. Sorry. There we're like go. wrapping it up. <laughs> You know, I'm not really sure you want to hear from me, but I was born in rural Alabama. Fast forward to today, my children had a very, very different life from me. They went to integrated schools. They both are now in the business world. And I cannot tell you how many times I have to take a phone call for how they are treated in the work. Mm, yeah. And these are people who sing in church, but you never confess that I'm still doing this yeah. and that I'm causing mental illness on young people who are prepared to do a work that you're still saying, your skin tells me you're not. I just don't know that we've made the strides we think we've made. Yeah. I'm not saying that to be mean, but I'm saying it's heavily out here in this real world today. Yeah. The church is not the real world today. Just because we can get the white car to move and sing like blacks is not the real world today. Yeah. And I cannot tell you how many people are suffering. And I'm here because I want to learn. I want to know how to help. I put myself out there, and I'm going to continue to do that. But I don't even know how to help my own children. And the reason I'm so moved now is because I told them on the way here, when they pick me up, I'm on the phone with my daughter crying. Mm. I need to work. But I don't need to be treated like this. Mm. Yes, Thank you all for what you're doing. Yeah. Thank, Thank you me. to this church for what you're opening up to. We need more of this. We need conversations. 
We need to understand, we need to tell the truth. We need to look into our hearts and our minds and tell the truth. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. All right, so, so uh, folks, we are happy to talk with you and to sign some books. Uh, Timothy, do we want to just sort of go that way? Do yes, so that you'll way? go right through these doors <laughs> over here to uh, make a immediate left, and James Gallery will be right there. Okay. Thank you all.